Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here with Carmine Vittoria, the author of Bitter Chicory to Sweet Espresso. So welcome, Carmine. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm especially excited to talk to you because a lot of people ask about um, Italy during the war and post-war, and um, interesting experience. Two interesting things that I got out right. of, of the book is that one, the first one is my grandparents came to the United States um, just just before World War One because my grandfather served in Libya in 1911 and my grandmother didn't want him going to war again. Uh, and the second thing is when they did come, they left my oldest uncle Giovanni behind in um, Torito, and he did not come here until 1950. So he hadn't seen his family uh, or his parents for 35 years and had never met his brothers and sisters. Uh -huh. May I ask you where from in Italy? Uh, yeah, uh, my dad's family comes from Naples. Naples? Yeah. Right in Naples, city of Naples. Right in Naples, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, and I'll tell you something about that in a second. And mom's family was, uh, they were from Torito, Bari. Uh, but, but that's mom. Um, my grandmother came from two noble families, Piramalo and Cracciolo. I see. I don't know the town, but anyway, that's fine. Uh, but let's talk about you because that's what we're here for. So um, you lived through the war. In, yes, in Naples, yeah? Yeah. And uh, I was born in this uh, town, uh, which sits right on this on the side of a mountain, Montavella. And um, the town itself goes way back, way, way, way back. Um, back to the Roman days, actually, Greek times and so on. The, the name itself in those days was called Abella with a B, not with a V. It's A-B-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A, Abella. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a variety of hazelnuts. Hazelnuts are nuts, you know, like that mm -hmm. they come. And there are 18 species of them. One of them is Abella, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> Hence, the name comes from hazelnuts uh, species. And uh, in fact, the only industry there, I won't call it industry, but it's sort of people made a living from, or three things. Number one was hazelnuts. You see hazelnuts all over the world. Most likely they come from Avella mm -hmm. or nearby. Two, olive oil. And three, shepherds, the dairy uh, uh, industry. But that's dying out. The, the days of the shepherds is dying out. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm half breed. In other words, my mother was a shepherd and my father was a barber, Barbier di Sevilla. But anyway, and um, so how they got together, I don't know. You know, I could guess, but uh, anyway, uh, so the shepherd family goes way back. And the, and the name of it was... Uh, Everything, it's a Volscian tribe. In those days, they were called the, the Volscian tribes, but the, there's a better no, Semnites. Sem, there were two tribes. One was the Semnites, and the other one was the Volscian. But nobody ever mentioned the Volscian, but they, they were there. But you gotta remember, these people are nomads, i.e., shepherds. They, they crossed each other borders. There's no such thing as a border to a nomad, right? right. And so, and, and so, the Semites have su survived even before, well, they, they were there even before the Etruscans began to make their move before the Romans, and, and they fought the, the, the Etruscans. Then the Romans came along, and they fought the Romans. The only difference is they lost out. And the, and the, and the Semites, or the, the people of Avella that were uh, allied with the Romans, and they were rewarded by Emperor Sulla. And he said, since you helped us defeat the Semnites, we're going to build you an amphitheater, which was really a Greek theater. And they extended and make a field out of it. Now, 
they call it amphitheater, but in all realities, they also had, uh, uh, it's like a small Colosseum where they had the, 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 you know, these people killing each other over there. But whenever I call, I refer to that as a Colosseum, people get upset because in their minds, they think of the Colosseum in Rome, right? The big Colosseum, yeah. the Colosseum. But even that one is an amphitheater. It's really a takeoff from the Greek theater that people extended and made something else out of it. Okay. Am I talking too much? No, 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 no. This is, this is, this is great. And, and in fact, I, I did uh, do a, a, an interview with somebody or actually somebody did it for me about the Samites who I, I had never known about before. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of people don't believe all this tribal Italian stuff, but yeah. it did exist. But anyway, Sula rewarded them with this amphitheater or Colosseum. But then the valley between my town and Naples is a valley, big valley. It extends from the Bay of Naples up to the hills of the Apennine Hills. And there's a big valley. In fact, on top of Monte Valle, you can see Vesuvius staring right into your face. Mm -hmm. And now that valley has been invaded by so many people is unbelievable. It's not a question who invaded the valley. The question is who did not invade the valley. I mean, you name it, they invaded. For example, uh, in, in 2000, uh, 200 BC, or two, uh, to be precise, 217 BC, Hannibal invaded the, the valley, okay? A thousand years later, about oh, 800, 900 AD, then the Saracens from Libya as well, or, or Tunisia, the, mm -hmm. and in those days it was called Carthage, you know? Right. And uh, so, and they, that area of people invaded that valley again a thousand years. Then remarkably, a thousand years later, that area, soldiers from that area, Tunisia nowadays, and Algeria, and Morocco, invaded the same valley a thousand years later. In fact, every thousand years, there's been invasion from that part of the world into the valley. Now, the question I have is, will, will we have another invasion a thousand years from now? I don't know, maybe, <laughs> who knows? But that's, a, that's an artifact that I, I, I'm very amused by it. Uh, that's interesting. So as far as you know, right, your family's been in that town or in that valley for ever, yeah. Forever, and but the, and, and the town is sort of a schizophrenic in the sense <laughs> that. Uh, but by the way, I should mention there there is a castle that they that the you know those uh, pilgrimage in the in during the Middle East and all that in the twelve hundred, and they use that castle up on a mountain. But anyway, back to 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 the the family. Well. The, 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 the town is spread in two ways. The town itself is sort of uh, commercial-like. You know, you have the barber, you have the uh, the meat uh, baker and so on and so forth. And then you have the, the shepherd uh, clan, if you wish, mm -hmm. at least in my days. I'm talking about my days, okay? And they were split. None, they didn't talk to each other. I mean, they really did not. I.e., if you were a shepherd, you married in the shepherd family. If you were an artisan, you marry somebody in the artisan. Now, in my family, it was strange. A shepherd married an artisan, like so. And I don't think uh, the marriage was condoned on both sides, if you know what I'm saying. I know what you mean, yeah. So, uh, because a lot of the marriages in those days, I would say, they, they, they were fixed in some sense, within mm -hmm. the shepherd and also within the, the artisan. Believe it or not, in those days, uh, the people use the mandolin, the mandolin, mandolino, mandolin, to serenade a woman. And my mother used to tell me, well, you know, I was serenade many times. And but nowadays, who in the hell serenade? Nobody <laughs> serenades anybody anymore. <laughs> Nobody plays the mandolin. They don't even know how to play the mandolin. So anyway, uh, so but now I ever though the shepherd tradition, people, the young people say, hey, wait a minute, I don't need this hard work. Think about this. If you're a shepherd, you're up in the mountain. 
the weather, when, the, when you have storms up there, uh, it is terrible, believe me. And I've been up there, okay? And, uh, and, and, you, and you travel up on the hills, you look for that grassland or flat valley to, to rest and whatever, and you keep on going. I mean, for example, you travel north toward Rome or south toward Calabria, like that. But mm -hmm. up on the mountain, always up on the mountains like that. And, uh, and what do you get out of it? Well, you know, you make wool, you know, you sell that uh, to, the, to the stores and uh, nearby the big towns like Naples, Nola, whatever like that. But uh, living is hard. And so I can understand a lot of the shepherds but they say, hey, enough of this, I've had it. And they go, they drift to other places. They go up north Italy to get a job, menial job, whatever it is. Or they travel abroad in Northern Europe. And they're like the United States. In fact, I, I, I just wrote a book like that. And it's, um, it's called uh, Once Upon a Hill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see what it's about. It's about two friends there were shepherds, and um, and they decided to immigrate to the United States. One went one way, one went the other way, and 50 years later, they met again in Boston. Ah. And and their career was much different. Uh, one was uh, uh, you know, the lure of greed, you know, let's put it this way, it was attracted to him. And the other one was academics. And, and it takes place in Boston. It talks about Whitey Bulger. It talks about oh, yeah. mafia. It talks about the immigrants. It talks about the social structure. And believe it or not, it talks about the bocce crowd. You know, bocce, mm -hmm. the game of bocce. Yeah. And it talks about all the visitors we had. You won't believe the type of visitors we had over there at the Bochy Court. We had mayors, governors, we had uh, actors, sports figures, you name it, they're all there. In fact, in fact, we even had visitors from the 9-11 that uh, those bastards that, that, uh, that drove that airplane into the buildings. The name was ATTA, A-T-T-A. In fact, they were there playing Bochy. They were like little boys. They looked so innocent. I thought, those goddamn so-and-so, I'm not going to say the word. <laughs> and I see that face. I remember that face. Really? Uh, yes. So so let me ask you this. So um, you were uh, around 10 or 11 when you came to the States. Yeah. How, how, how did you I wind up? No. How did you wind up? How, how did you wind up coming? Huh? How did you wind up coming to the States? Well... My, my grandfather was sick. He, you know, he worked in the factories, the steel industry, you know, and um, and he had what they call black lung disease, mm -hmm. you know, black lung. And, and but in those days, in the early 50s, uh, mid 50s, they didn't recognize it as such as a black lung disease. They call it something else. He couldn't breathe or there's something wrong with his lungs, whatever like that. And he was very sickly. And so Basically, we went there to help him out, you know, but, but within about, oh, I would say six months, he died, you know, and, and so we came over there. What was your question again? Sorry. Now, how, did you, how did you wind up coming in? So your, so your grandfather had come to the States, but your, your parents didn't. And, and if, I, if, if I read it correctly, you, your dad. My grandfather didn't. came to the United States, correct. 19... Um, uh, either right after the war or before the war, World War One, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, and, and he, you know, he uh, worked in this, uh, what they call J&L, Lachlan and Jones Steel Company. But he, he came by, but he came by himself. By himself. And the reason he had to do that, he was a shepherd, you see? Mm -hmm. And the reason he had to come is because what happened was all his sheeps were poisoned. The, 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 the sheep ate some stuff, whatever it is, and uh, grass was not uh, good for the sheep. Not only his sheep died, but also his friend's sheep. What happens is whenever a shepherd took the sheep out, not only did he, to he took his sheep as well as neighbors and so on and so forth like that, and he took turns 
in, in taking the sheep. You follow what I'm saying? Yep, yep, yep. And so, and, and he owed taxes on it. He owed taxes on it. And, and, and what happened, he went to America and he paid off all the debts, all the taxes he owed and so forth. And in fact, the, the way you pay taxes in Italy, in those days, you paid 30 years in advance or something like that, uh, 40 years, 30, 40 years. And he paid again uh, in the 50s, I believe, 40s and 50s for another 30 years. I ever though, what happened was right after the war, the tax collector somehow or another uh, declared that the, the property that my grandfather owned on the top of the mountain, Montevella, didn't, did not pay taxes. And therefore there was an auction on it. And guess what? He was the only one bidding <laughs> on the property. I don't know, on his own property. Uh, and isn't that beautiful? So, so, so now when, now during the war, I know you were a young boy, but do you recall uh, the war years and, and what was going on? And 53, 54, I came over here. I remember I, I went to remedial school for, for nine months, I think, something like that. Maybe short, maybe six, seven months, seven to nine months, I can't remember, to learn English, to learn the, the culture, American culture and all that. And then at the end of that, in fact, in June around sometimes, maybe later, the, my teacher, her name was Mrs. Docchio, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and Mrs. Eyes, you know. <laughs> and, and she recommended me to the principal where I lived uh, in, in high school. And she said, okay, I'm gonna recommend you to the ninth grade level. Here I was only 13 years old. As you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I was the youngest kid in class, 13 years old. And I was flunking out, you know, because first of all, I was flunking English. I didn't know English that well. And I was flunking this course called algebra. And uh, me too. I hated algebra. Yeah. And so I went to the teacher and I said to the algebra teacher, I said, listen, uh, um, I know how to add numbers, I know how to divide numbers, I know some geometry. I said, what do I do with X and Y? <laughs> you know, and I said, I have no idea. And one, one uh, a friend of mine, a football player, big guy, uh, and Enrico Antonini, I used to call him Rigo, big as a mountain. He was a fullback. Believe me, in those days, 230 pounds fullback. Can you imagine that in the 50s? And he, he pulled over, you know, he's a tremendous player. But anyway, and he and I took uh, the, the, the course together. And said, come and listen to me. This is for sanctity, it's not for us. Forget about it. I said, no, 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 no. Let me stick to it. Let me stick to it. But one day he came to my homeroom. He said, come and I got the secret to X and Y. And he explained it to me. He said, X can take any number. Y can do the same thing. Ah, oh, I said, freedom, <laughs> beautiful freedom. <laughs> Once I got the hang of it, I wasn't doing too bad, you know? <laughs> So then I went to the English teacher and I said, uh, I, I said to the English teacher, what can I do to pass this course? And she said, not much. Your, your language is terrible. And, you know, I have no choice. I said to her, listen, you, you have us reading this Ivano, you know, Ivano about uh, Robin Hood and all that. I said, I don't know what to do with that. I, said, I don't know the, whether to flip a coin or what, to, you know, to understand what the, what the book is about. And I said, there, I'll make a deal with you. I said, you have us reading Merchant of Venice, you know, Shakespeare, right? I said, I'll memorize for you one page of, of Merchant of Venice. Will you pass me, give me a D minus. That's all right. So he is, you know, I said, he is embarrassing. He said, I, uh, let me think about it. Like, so the next day, next day, not the next week, I, I memorized two pages of Merchant of Venice. But she couldn't figure out heads or tails what I was saying. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, those are funny days. So, so now you, you and your mom are that you were allowed to come into the states directly. See, my uncle, uh, he even though his whole family was born here, uh, except for him and and his the the second child, my my aunt, the oldest daughter. Um, 
he could not come directly into this into the United States, even though at one time at the end of World War II, my grandmother had five sons in the yeah. service. Uh, and they had to go to Canada for five years before they came in. But uh-huh. you were able to come straight in because your grandfather was sick. Is that yeah? How you well, got I came by boat. You know, we have, mm-hmm. the boat that we came by was Constitution. Yeah. You know, the Constitution. But because I remember in the same year, Andrea Doria sunk, you know, off the coast of Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were afraid to, to take the ship. But, you know, what choice do we have? You know, either you come to America or forget about it. So we, we came in the middle of winter. <laughs> Unbelievable. So anyway, we we came by the Constitution and and we came to New York City. We were picked up by a distant relative and we stayed there. At that time, they had, uh, um, oh, what's the name? There was a famous singer. To, he sang a some enchanted evening. No, no, no. What's the name of that movie? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, um, I, th- th- I think that was South Pacific. I think was the was, yeah, the, was the movie like, or the play. Yeah, it's a famous Italian uh, baritone. They used to sing it beautifully. I forget his name, but anyway, he was on TV, and that was so beautiful to hear. And they had this this uh, TV program in the afternoon, Howdy Doody. Yes, way I'm back. Right. Howdy yeah. Doody and all that. That's okay. I used to love it. So that was New York, beautiful. And and uh, and they took us for a ride at Yankee Stadium, just to ride around around Queens. And and at that time, we were living right next to the airport. It used to be called Idlewild Airport. Idlewild, Idlewild Airport in New York City. So now we stayed there about three, four days in New York City. And we took a train, overnight train, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We got there, it was the middle of winter, January, and there was about two feet of snow. And and here we are, we were, we were not dressed for winter. We had like clothes, you know, well, not like clothes, we had a sweater and that's about it. So I looked at my mother and I looked at my brother and the face could, could say it all. What the, we doing over here? What, what is this? And we were so disappointed. So finally we get to see my grandfather. He was on, you know, on bed and all that. Some family was taking care of him. And, uh, and the first thing happened was they assigned us to this uh, remedial school. We had to take two buses, one to downtown Ambridge and then across the river to Alaquipa. The town of Aliquippa is where Mike Ditka, the famous football player, came ah, from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mike Ditka. I remember Ambridge and Aliquippa used to have rivalries, and we the the Ambridge used to have the three Irishmen. One was Guido, Guido. The second one was Marcello. The third was was Antonini. <laughs> the black Irishman. And, and and Guido was a hell of a beautiful player, unbelievable running back. And we played the Isla Quipa. And uh, and there on the first play on from scrimmage, Joe Guido had this nice he would dart left and then cut back. And there's a famous I, I, you could see coming. Everybody blocked it nicely. You know. The only difference is Mike Ditka was waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he leveled them off. He broke two ribs and he didn't play the rest of the game. So so, so you played ball with Mike Ditka or against Mike Ditka? No, no, no. I didn't play football, but I, I'm telling you about you the did. football team. And all ah, that. okay. So, and the, 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 the running backs were all Italian Americans, you know. One was Antonini, Marcello, and Guido. And they're very nice people, very, very nice. I, I met them, I talked to them. You know, let's face it, you come to America as a little kid, right? And you don't want to stick out like the rest of the kids. So what is the first thing you learn? You learn how to play basketball, you learn how to play football, and you learn how to play baseball. And I learned all three of them, right? Mm-hmm. And that's all I did. It'll come rain, come rain, or come sunshine, whatever. I was out in the playground playing basketball with this and that and so forth. And I learned English that way. That's probably the best way. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure it was the best way. Uh, yeah, you know, my um, 
like I said, it was interesting when growing up because, you know, of course, my mom's family, everybody spoke um, English because they were all born here, except for my uncle Giovanni, and he had, and all his children all had Italian accents. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was very interesting. And my um, my dad's family, his the his oldest brother and his, two of his uh, two of his three sisters, the older two sisters, were born in Circola, in just outside of Naples. Um, but they came young, so they didn't really, you know, they really didn't have the accents like my grandparents did, you know? Um, so, so what did, now, did you, when you were, when you were a little boy in Italy, did you encounter any German troops, American troops, British troops? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, to begin with, it was, you know, I, I, I was a little boy, I mean, little two or three years old, whatever. And, and there was turmoil in my grandfather's uh, house. And, and the turmoil was about, there was some, they said, there's some soldiers by the cemetery. And uh, at first we thought, oh, well, no, not we, I, I was thinking those days, right? I mean, and there was, the, 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 the elders were uh, talking very, very fast and all that. Who's there, who are they, this and so forth. So my grandfather said, don't worry, I'm gonna go there to the cemetery dirt road and find out who they are. So he puts me on his shoulder, right? Mm. Why me? I have no idea, I have no idea. So as we walking toward this, uh, the cemetery and this dirt road, I don't know where out of the bushes came out somebody on a motorcycle. And it was a German guy, you know? And and my grandfather was shocked, and I didn't know he did. Oh, that's, that's cute, you know, and all that. And so, and then we keep walking, we keep walking. Finally, we get to the cemetery, a little bit past cemetery, and mm. and all of a sudden we're staring into one huge tank. I mean, big, big tank took up the whole dirt road. <laughs> I said, well, well, and, we, and my, my grandfather, no, I said, where, where do we go here? How do we go around them? And so we went to the ditch and mm -hmm. took go by. And, and, they, and the German, they were very inquisitive. They wanted to know where are the caves? Oh. Interesting. Yeah. And, and my grandfather, he, he owned a farm at that time. As far as I can tell, you know, I, I'm, right now I am guessing because being that, uh, that young, I was not privy to their conversation. Sure, right. But, but I remember him pointing toward the mountain, Montebella. I remember that much. So my guess, and this is purely guess, he was telling them there's a big, huge cave right in the middle of the mountain. Okay, in fact, that's San Miguel, St. Michael, okay. And in fact, later on after the war, uh, uh, during Christmas time or Christmas Eve, we attend mass over there at St. St. Michael uh, uh, Cave over there. There's an altar and all that, like so. At the bottom of that, of the cave, there's a creek uh, that water flows, uh, that's a Flanio Creek. And what happens there is that especially at that time in December, if it rains, it begins to flood. Mm -hmm. And you cannot cross, cross there and go to town. And you're stuck there, <laughs> okay? But anyway, he was gonna drive over there and tell him to go there, right? And that was about five miles away from the town, roughly, you know, more or less. And in, I ever, he, what he did not tell him that there were two caves right next to his farm, which is right in the town Abavella. He didn't want them close by, you know what I mean? And eventually what happened, the Germans discovered those two caves and also they camped about a mile or kilometer to the right side of that, you know, about a couple of miles from the farm, okay? There were no dummies. And if you ask me what, the, what German division came, 
I think one must have meant, well, I, I, I'm guessing now, uh, the, uh, the Hermann Goring Division and the 14th Panther Division mm -hmm. uh, came by that time. Uh, I did some research on that, that's how I know. Now, later on, that was about oh, uh, August, September, about time frame around that time, you know, August, about like that. And then about in November time, around that time, uh, late or mid October, some November, then we had these British troops come in, uh, Scottish troops with the bagpipes and all mm -hmm. that, and uh, you know, like that, they would come into town, and they and they went through the main street of a, of Avella toward the the farms, where the farms were, including my grandfather. Little did we know, or little did my grandfather know. He took over his farm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and you got to remember, in those days, the whole town was starving. There's no food. Yeah, yeah. And people were making coffee from dry leaves of chicory and dry uh, flower buds. And, and there's no sugar. So when they made that coffee, it was bitter. And it was miserable time. Me. I tasted that. It was bitter, bitter, bitter. And so, anyway, he uh, he went to the uh, to the camp, and he was shocked, of course, to see the, the way the whole farm was taken over, and the way the, the, the German troops were very not German, but the British troops were very meticulous. They 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 they, they made roads on the farm by painting rocks the white color, you know, like that, to guide you from <laughs> one barrack to another. Yeah. As a, as a kid, oh, that's beautiful. You know, you, it's like toys, you know, these rocks painted white and so forth. And then all he, he had his hand out. He wants some money, some food or something, you know? And so he, uh, and it's, you know, they're very polite, very courteous. And they said, oh, yeah, sign this paper here. Put in his application. No, no, and he did that. And we waited and waited. After about a couple hours, they said, go to barrack number so and so. So you follow the white rocks and you go there, right? And again, the same thing. Oh, yeah, here, fill this paper here. And we spent the whole damn day over there. At the end of that, they handed him a loaf of bread. Did you ever eat Wonder Bread? Yeah. <laughs> Now, the only difference between that bread and the Wonder Bread was that bread was not sliced. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But at least it was some food. It yeah. was some bread. We didn't have any bread. And, and it was, uh, you know, anyway, those were the times. Um, now, I can go on. Uh, by, by the way, all of this is in the book, by the way. It's uh, very, uh, very nicely read, I believe. Uh, yeah, and I was, that's what I was going to say. For people who want to get the the you know the the full story, that you know they could get the book on Amazon, and also uh, when I do the blog post, I know you sent me a link for a YouTube presentation, so I'm going to put that out there too, so people could get uh, some more interesting facts. And you know, the one thing that I'll, I'll mention that my cousin, um, she's um, I think she's about ninety now, so she was a she was a teenager. Uh, and when, when the war was on and, um, she said that, you know, they used to have to run from the farmhouse in Bari and, and my aunt would gather up all the kids and run into the field. And, but she told me basically they had beans to eat. That's what they had to eat. Uh, and, um, she said the Germans were there, but you didn't see a lot. Uh, and then later on the Americans and the British came in, uh, but she was, she said she was. I guess she was like maybe 13 or 14. Yeah. Uh, and she said she was, you know, kind of afraid of the soldiers at that point. And probably for good reason, being a young girl, you know. Anyway, continuing on with the story about my grandfather. One day, you know, you got to remember, this is uh, November, December, again, cold weather. I mean, in Italy, it really, at least in the southern Italy, it really doesn't get as cold as here. Ice, you know, like ice temperature, whatever. Mm -hmm. But 
that wind from the from the mountain it, it hits you it bones is really it's really cold and so and, and my grandfather said, well, you know what, let's change the rule here. Maybe the wind will be different if we go down like this. And I remember we, we fell off like almost like eight feet, boom, straight down from our, his farm to another farm. I realized later on as I as an adult, that's the fault line <laughs> of earthquake. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Boom, straight down. <laughs> and, and then we went across this farm. And it was all hazelnuts all over. What it was, it was a, a farm for hazelnuts, but the farmers weren't there. And then we came across this big structure. It looked like a building, but, but it was covered with ivies, covered with trees and all that. And then, uh, and, uh, and my grandfather was curious, what the hell is that? And so and there was a big portona, big door about 30 feet higher. So he took the ivies away. It was a big door. And in front of it, it had Roman statues broken up and, and rocks all over and removed them. And finally, he, he pushed the portal and pushed the door into it, into this big, huge building. And guess what it was? It was the amphitheater. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. And so I said to myself at that time, I said, but you see, I didn't pay attention to it. As a little kid or little child, I, I was busy. I was busy because there was these big black ants. They would dig a hole and go into that hole. I would plug it up with dirt and then they would show up another place <laughs> and on and on and on. It was a losing proposition. So I gave up. <laughs> so finally, Anyway, my grandfather discovered that amphitheater, and I asked myself now, I said, why was it covered like that? For two reasons. Number one, if Rome discovered such site, they, they would have to buy the land, and then the farmer would have to sell at the state price, which would be cheap, Right. number right. one. And number two, he will lose his business, hazelnut, which is very profitable. So he lose twice, not once. Hence, the farmers would cover that up. And in fact, if you look all around the, 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 the amphitheater, there are little uh, like um, stones that the Romans would have around the, the Colosseum, the guide or whatever, the street like that. Those were covered as well. Ah, oh, that's great. So um, Zoom Zoom is going to cut us off in less than a minute. So okay. I, I just want to I just want to make sure that everybody knows the book. It's bitter chicory to sweet espresso, and I want to thank you for having this conversation with me. And um, I'll send you all the links and and everything once everything's finished. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you. Uh,